eight. What's that? I said we said eight. Eight. What happened to you? No, 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 no. I I said I said eight thirty. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, call Burnett. Um, let where in where were you? You were were you with Nancy Wilson? When you when you first crossed paths with with Garaldi, how did you how did you guys cross paths and begin working together? I'm with Cal Jeter. Continue. I was working. I was working with Cal Jeter when I when I first met him because he was at one, at one point he and Cal used to play together. Exactly. They they played uh, and and the band you were in with Cal was was uh, Louis Gilbert. Peraza, Johnny Ray? Or no, you were on drums, I'm sorry. And, yeah. and that was, that was Zuleika. Zuleika, the guy who used to break out in rashes. Right, right. <laughs> so, so you were with Cal, and had you seen Vince before uh, play, or what, he came up to you? Uh, and, I, met him, I met him then, because we were working at uh, uh, Bill Matador. That was home base for Cal Jeter's band. Mm -hmm. When we were when we were at home, when we were not on the road, when he was not on the road, because I was playing there, I ended up moving to San Francisco. I got a place in San Francisco, and I stay there, and I go home on on uh, Sunday night. When we finish working, I go home on Sunday night and come back. Uh, Tuesday. So there would be like, so let me get this straight. You moved to, you were living in Los Angeles, but you moved to San Francisco. And yeah, my family was in LA. Right. And I got a place that I was able to keep. I had an apartment in, in San Francisco as well. Okay, so you would you would after the after the the uh, after Jader when he was in town when he wasn't on on the road, uh, you he would play the El Matador Sunday night. You would yeah. Sunday night you would go back. That was home base. That was home base for him. Absolutely. Now, so right so for me, uh, uh, Mark Montgomery got me a place in a, in a, in a uh, house for musicians called the Happy House in San Francisco. <laughs> wow. You talk about that, the happy house. It must have been a very happy house if it was, you and Monk were living oh, there. Yeah. It was all musicians there. Who else was living there? Uh, Flip Nunez, the <laughs> player. <laughs> I love it. Him. Oh, I mean, he's, listen, he was with Jerry Grinelli and Noel Jukes and Fred Marshall. I covered that too. All in, well, Fred, Noel Jukes uh, was living there. Clarence uh, The drummer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great drummer. Uh, who else? Man. Uh, somebody else. <laughs> somebody else. Anyway, anyway, Mark Montgomery had a place that he kept. And, um, Wes Montgomery had a place, but he ended up giving it up. And I probably got the one that he had. Right, and so, so, so you would go back to see your family on Sunday night, and then Tuesday you'd come back to San Francisco for, for that week run with. For that week. And so, uh, we played Tuesday through Sunday. And so, Tuesday through Sunday, two sets a night at the El Matador. We played what three, three sets a night. Oh my. Gosh, Zuleika, Burnett, and w Gilbert was on bass? Yeah, well, he was on, uh, he was, uh, uh, Mark Montgomery was the bass player when I first joined the band. He's uh, the one that helped me get in the band. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that was the, when, yeah. When he left, I got Stan Gilbert in the band. Stan Gilbert. That that was the classic story about your twenty first birthday in in Vail or somewhere in Colorado when you guys got the yeah, steaks uh, and packed Colorado. <laughs> you you packed them into the the snow right. Right. Uh, <laughs> the animals got out of me. <laughs> 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 that was about no snow. <laughs> so we figured, man, we can bury this out there. The freezer's not working. Oh my God! So so. <laughs> 
so so um, uh, talk about the first time. Did Geraldi approach you? How how did you guys meet? Well, see, he used to come and sit in from time to time because he was working a block over at the show. See, it used to be a play. Charlie Brown was a play. That's he wrote all the music for this play, and the play was going on at another place, at a theater, a block over from, from Broadway, North Beach. So, some nights, he would come by and sit in with us after the show was over. Wow. And you guys would be, and he'd pick, and whatever tunes, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about. He had an opportunity to record the music, so he had Stan and I to do the, the record with him, to do that, uh, that, that LP. You're a good man. Uh, a good boy. Yeah, what was it? You're a good man, Charlie Brown. You're a good man. Right. Yeah, something like that. So, so he, so he started to sit in with you guys, and and then like after that, you guys would start, you know, just just talking or, or hanging out. Would he come back to the happy house? He, he used to come and play with us. Right. No. No. I get that. But then, um, but then, like outside of that, um, did you have opportunities to n- not with Cal, but just playing with him live? No, we didn't do any live playing with him. Right, so you just took on. He said to you guys, "I need other a." Ri- than, other than other than when he sat in and played with Cal, and you know, a couple of times you know, like I didn't, didn't make it, and it was a night when the show wasn't going on, so he played with Cal that night. Those nights. So then he, uh, how did the how did the discussion even come up that he that uh, to ask you guys about playing in, on that on that record? Well, you know, we we became friends from from uh, those exchanges that we did when he played with Cal's band with us. So he, so he said, "Man, we, I, I got to do this album," and, he, and uh, he asked us to do it with him. So when he was doing, what was the name of the of the theater, by the way, that that Charlie Brown was was playing at? I can't remember. I can't remember the name of the theater. Okay, well, well, I'll get on that. But I just, I just knew it was a block over from from Broadway in uh, North Beach. And he and he didn't uh, he didn't want to use the rhythm section that was playing with him for the th- the shows themselves at the theater. No. So what about no. that? What about that session? I actually found that album here, uh, and it, it it does list you guys on the back, if I'm correct. Yeah. We're on, we're listening on the album. Talk about what your memories are from that from that session. Was it de- was it done down at uh, Warner Brothers in Southern Cal, or where where did that recording happen? We recorded it in uh, San Francisco. At Wally Hyder or where? Uh, it wasn't Wally Hyder. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what the studio was, man. Um, that may be listed on the back too. What what do you what are you like? Were you familiar with the tunes? I mean, how how did did you get the charts that day? Or was it just very organic? Can you can you talk about the session at all? Yeah, we uh, we had, we uh, he told us about what was happening, and uh, he gave us the, the charts that he wanted to do, and uh, we went in the studio a couple couple days and uh, and did I think three days and uh, recorded it. I'm trying to remember. Uh, Stan Gilbert was on bass, caught Burnett was on drums, and did you have, uh, was there a guitar player on it? Was it a quartet or just yeah, a... Yeah, it was a guitar player that, that uh, used to work with him and they worked with Cal Lock as well. Uh, but I, for the life of me right now, I can't think of his name, and my copy of the record is in the garage. <laughs> Hold on, uh, I, yeah, no, you got you got a copy. I'm gonna have to dig that. I, was it Eddie Duran? Eddie Duran, yeah. It was Eddie Duran. Okay, okay, because he did used to play with Cal too. Right, right. Yeah, but not at the same time with, uh, with us. But he did. He did uh, play with Cal at one time. Did you ever play at the at the playpen? That sounds familiar, but I never played there. I don't think. Right. So, so at the time, 
you th- can you give me roughly the 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 year? Was it 67, 60, 68? I don't know. It was like sixty three, sixty early sixty two, three, four, five, sixty one through sixty five, something like that. Okay, because I'm I'm going back to the to the to the Jader album Los Banditos. The two tracks that unfortunately, you know, he, he couldn't take you guys to, or he did, you know, he wound up with a bunch of New York cats, and then, you know, the his West Coast band wound up on a couple of tracks. What was the name of that album again? Yeah, that was uh, Along Comes Cal. Along Comes Cal, and and, um, and that was a, and that was a new album for for Creed Taylor. Was that his first? It was Left Fantasy. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Left Fantasy, and it went with Reed Taylor, and that was the first album. And they wanted to use New York musicians. And Cal uh, was able to get us on part of it. Right, right. So, so, so Creed. Creed worked at Fantasy, and so he wanted to make a bigger, a bigger splash with some guys like Chick Corea, and he wanted to put some bigger names. No, Creed, Creed had he had started the. Uh, his record company at that point. It wasn't. He wasn't. It wasn't Fantasy. Cal had been with Fantasy before. Remember, mm-hmm. Fantasy used to make those red LPs. <laughs> That's right. Yes, of course. And, and uh, when he went with Green Taylor, it was uh, he was based in New York, so uh, most of it had to be done there. Right, and if I remember correctly, Creed actually started that because Along Comes Cal's on Verve, so that was really before Verve, 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 Verve right. right, right. But and Verve was, <clears throat> and then so you'd see Creed's name, and then eventually came came CTI, which was CTI, right? That right. Was after. That was after, and then actually Cal Cal rendezvoused with Fantasy again in the early seventies when you were. With Gene Harris on Blue Note, that Cal went back to Fantasy on the. Those were the less sexy brown label pressing Fantasy records. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. When Vince, but I went with the three sounds. I left. I had my path was to understand time, and I got that from Mondo Peraza. Can you can you can you uh, expand on that? Well, uh, he was he was the key to what was happening at Cal at the time. Before that, he had uh, Mongo Santa Maria and Willie Bobo as a foundational thing, which established the uh, Latin concept on the West Coast, and then eventually threw it out everywhere. But uh, Mongo and uh, Willie Bobo were the key. To the success of Cal and, and uh, that Latin venture. So when they left, he was he spent his time trying to recreate that. So uh, he got Armando Barraza after that, and I think Johnny Ray was the next drummer. But see, he, he still had. A love for playing drums, so Johnny Ray was was good because he played vibraphone and drums as well. Right. So when he left, they'll, he, I think he got another drummer for a minute. Uh, who, uh, you mentioned his name one time. It, I can't think of it now. In, in this conversation or some other conversation? Vince. Vince. Vince, uh, Vince Latiano? Latiano. Yeah, w- he, didn't, he didn't play vibes. Right. So, so Monk got, talked to him about me. I was living in L.A. at the time. Because we had been working together. I had been playing around in, in L.A. I, you know, doing things. So he told me about me and uh, got me an audition with, with Cam. Wow. So I came up to San Jose. Not San Jose. San Mateo. San Mateo. Right, right. Yeah. Came up there. And uh, played at a hotel that was made just like the hotel in Las Vegas. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I sat in with him, and uh, since I played vibes and drums, it was his opportunity to be able to, to do both. So he had been a drummer with, with uh, uh, Brubeck. 
Dave Brubeck before, and he still liked playing drums. So uh, he was able to do both. So we uh, we, we switched out and did both. So there would be... So I got the yeah, go ahead. I got the job with him, and uh, Monk got me a place to live at the Happy House. And uh, that was like the home base for Cal and, and the band. So when we went out on the road, we had the same thing because for me and Monk, we were on the road all the time. Even though we were we were staying in San Francisco, we both still lived in LA. Right. So we were communicating back and forth. So we were still getting road pay, where the, the local guys were, were getting lesser than road pay, pay and less and less until we went out on the road. Right, they were just getting the the uh, money for the night for the for the for the night they would play. But you guys were actually out. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was a different thing. But when we went on the road, the pay was different. Right. It, it stopped when we came to L.A. to play because he was traveling. That made it a road band. So we still got road play pay when we came to L.A. Even though we lived in L.A. Yeah, you must have been. That's. Dude, that's a pretty slick deal because that was your home base. Yet you were still getting road pay. Yeah. <laughs> so my home base was <laughs> That's that. What a Carl. Looking back, was that? I mean, that must have been one of the one of the highest points of your of your playing career. Uh, the, based on the not just the money, but the the camaraderie and the flexibility and the idea that you were seeing different places, traveling around, playing the polyrhythm music that you love so much? I mean, it must have been just a thrill. Yeah, but, but, but my whole career was that because I did it in stages. I did Cal because that's the music I started really that I loved first, really. I mean, I, I dealt with other music before that. And uh, I was with a singing group one time and did with some other musical things with Roy Ayers and stuff. But um, when I went with Cal, I was with a musical situation before that with a guy named Kirk Stewart who had been the musical conductor for Sarah Vaughan. Mm -hmm. And he and uh, 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 the bass player uh, from Passion. I can't think of his name right now. That's all right. That's all right. But uh, he had been the bass player with Clifford Brown and Max Roach. Hmm. George Morrow. George Morrow. Okay. George Morrow. So, uh, he, I worked with them, and uh, I left them to go join Cal. But we uh, uh, opened the hotel, and it was the International Hotel in, uh, in Los Angeles, right by the airport. Now it's the Renaissance, uh, the Radisson. It's called the Radisson now, it's mm -hmm. still there. Mm -hmm. But it was the, uh, uh, before it was, uh, about as blank. <laughs> anyway, we started at that hotel. We signed a contract, a five-year contract there, a year before they finished the hotel. We broke ground with the people when, when they came to build the hotel. Wow. So that was my first real uh, big musical job other than playing in nightclubs with, with uh, my band and with Roy's band. We had a band together. And there were different people around L.A. The idea of... But it was... Right. It was just a learning process uh, uh, and because it was a, really a musical time, a lot of music was happening, and uh, a lot of education was taking place just among the guys. But um, in, in, in my perspective in learning, uh, Cal was at first, well, I think that uh, the, the experience that I had with Kirk Stewart was the, the first real strong learning experience that I had. Uh, and I got the I got the job with him because uh, 
couldn't find anybody to to, to play the music. And uh, I had been playing vibes and, and not really playing drums a lot at that point. So I said, well, man, I, uh, I'm not really a, a proficient drummer at this point, but I can read the charts. So he said, well, I'm a music teacher. I'll teach you how to, if you can read the charts, I'll teach you how to play. Hmm. So he helped me to, to, to learn how to play. And uh, I started playing with him. And uh, we, we went, the first job was with Ernestine Anderson in Seattle. Went there, we came back and we signed this contract for that hotel in L.A. And it was, and, it, uh, it was, it, what, what, uh, Stewart, did he was, uh, did he play instrument too? He was a piano player. So he was a musical conductor for Sarah Vaughan. So he was a piano player, and was you, Morrow, and him in a trio with vocal accompanists? Yeah, he used to back different people, but he was a, a singer and piano player, and he, and that was a trio. Wow. He had a trio. Going back. And, uh, he was back, he was back singers. He, uh, uh, we, we used to back, uh, what happened was there was a club called the It Club in L.A. Mm -hmm. And while we were at the hotel, working downstairs in, in, the, in the lobby before they finished upstairs, we worked downstairs from uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon until, uh, say, 7.30. And then after they finished upstairs, we worked from 3.30 to 7.30 or so. And then we went upstairs to the penthouse and played there from like 8.30 to 1.30 at night. We did that six nights a week. On the weekend, the It Club, everybody that they hired, which was people like Miles Davis, Cold Train, Thelonious, Cannonball, all of the name artists who came to California, they played at the Hit Club. And uh, in the process, he would sign, uh, uh, John T. McLean signed a contract for everybody that played at the Hit Club, played at the Adams West Theater after hours on the weekend, Friday night after hours, Saturday night after hours. So, us being locals, we were the group that was the opening act for all these main musicians. And Kirk Stewart, being a, a, a musical conductor, we played for all the singers. Mm -hmm. and that was uh, uh, Ernie Andrews, uh, Sam Fletcher, uh, Ernestine Anderson, uh, Trying to think of a singer from Chicago, a lady. Uh, uh, man, I almost had her name. <laughs> but, uh, did, did you ever? Man. Yeah. Did you ever do any work with like uh, Irene Crawl or anyone like that? No, uh, that was much later. Was, okay, so yeah. Well, no, I think just going back for one minute. Um, you know, obviously it was looser, and and Vince would show up at the El Matador after the 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 theater shows. Um, how uh, how would you describe his his playing style as opposed to Zuleika? Was it like just basically putting on one shoe and then the other, or were they distinctly different sounds? And how did you uh, how did you come together? Because obviously he liked he liked the way Zuleika you Zuleika was was a more modern player. He was a more modern, fluid player. Herbie Hancock used to come and sit and listen to, to Al Zuleika. Every time he, they came to town when he was with Miles, first got with Miles, when he heard Zuleika, which, which he just, they were working at the uh, uh, jazz workshop across the street from the, from us. Right. When he heard Zuleika, he used to come over there every night when he was when he was in town and just sit and listen to Zuleika. Because he had a, a free-flowing playing method that uh, really suited what, what Herbie was doing. Well, listen. I listened to. I listened to. <clears throat> unfortunately, there's, there's no recordings of the of the Burnett Jader Monk Montgomery Zuleika 
Maybe there is. Maybe Gilbert has some. No. But, no, we didn't record. We didn't I'll record. tell you right now. Zuleika, yeah. Zuleika played with uh, another Jader incarnation with Dick Burke and John Hurd. And, and when I listened to him, holy cow. I mean, you want to talk progressive, uh, uh, just a gorgeous sound. But but talk about him as it re- and then and then juxtaposing that to when Garaldi would come in. Were you able to play the same uh, tunes like Los Banditos and those kinds of things? Were you, was he, was uh, how was? Yeah, they, played the, they played the same tune, but it wasn't the same sound. It wasn't the same thing. But but Vince had a, a, a style in his own. But it wasn't the same uh, uh, kind of thing that Al Zuleika played. He was he was more modern. Garaldi, what would you? He was a, yeah. He was a more fluid modern player. Like, uh, more like what Kirby was doing than what Vince was doing. But, but Vince's thing really came through more so in his thing with the choir and the, and the, and the chapel. Remember the album he did with the choir and the, and the, and the cathedral? Yes. I didn't know that was with a choir, though, but continue. Yeah, there was a, a choir, and uh, he, they played in the uh, cathedral, and and that was uh, probably his best playing, I think. And why do you say that? But, but it was the atmosphere that, that created another thing. Charlie Brown was, was, was another entity. Why do you feel like that was that with that that choir album? Uh, was it Grace Cathedral? I think probably Grace Cathedral. Right. right. Why do you think that that was a standout uh, for for Vince? Uh, because it was uh, more spiritual, I, th- I guess. Hmm. If you it was more of a, a spiritual form of music, Charlie Brown was uh, more entertainment. Uh, Comedic atmosphere to it. The um, uh, Zuleika was more progressive. What would be the the term uh, for Garaldi? Uh, was it was it uh, more, more? I wouldn't say it was progressive. It was, it was uh, uh, more. Uh, the Grace Cathedral was probably the best atmosphere for what he did. Now, the other thing I think stood out because the music was, 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 um, uh, the music was good, but it, it was like, uh, for a cartoon show. You know, Peanuts was, a, it was like a cartoon, uh, situation. Right. So it was, Light and comedic. Right, it had a, it had a, it had a like a, bo- a buoyancy to it because you were you were kid, mostly it was kids listening. I mean, I just it's funny. I found uh, we were listening that to was because of it. That was because of the show. Originally, it wasn't a kid play. It was just a, a, a play that took place in San Francisco that had these characters in the play. Now, when they when they made the cartoon, uh, the, these people and these kids became comedic because they made little kids in the, in the in the cartoon. Right. Those the, the, everyone kind of uh, played, took on their own roles, and kids could relate to them. Yeah. I, I I have an album. But the I kids, but the kids uh, in the play had on costumes, and they were these people. Right. No, no, I know that. Became, that, be- that became that became the cartoons in the in the, in the TV for TV. Absolutely. I have a when it went to when Charlie Brown was on. I think it was when they went to Broadway in New York. There's a record that came right. out, and the pictures on the back they're they're adults, all dressed right. up in their own characters, and they're all talking to each other like adults. So this was prior to the conversion to a children's series, which is inter- is really right. fascinating. That's really right. f- fascinating. That's really fascinating stuff. And then yeah. a- around six, so 
you that you're a good man, Charlie Brown. That that you're saying that was like '64. I, I don't even know if there's a date on the back of that, but that's when. I mean, it dropped early, but there had to be somewhere around there. '64, '63, somewhere right. around in there. And 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 that's when there was that's when they made the switch from a it went from a, a theater play to cartoon at that point. Right, and then they made it for for TV. When that's you when it became a cartoon. What was there a lot of dialogue in, uh, between you guys focusing on the idea that the music had to be maybe lighter than it than it had to be with the theater because it was going to be made for children? Was there any talk about that? No, because they were already performing it all the time. They had the band. They was performing the show every night. Right. They had the player every night. They were doing it every night. And do you know who was in that band? The, th- the th- in the theater. I don't. I, I, I don't have no idea who was in the band. <laughs> but when he got ready to record the LP, he came and got Stan and I. Yeah, so, no, no, what I was what I was saying before is Zuleika, uh, you know, we talked about his style. How would you des- uh-huh. how would you describe when Geraldi would come in and play with you guys, what was his style like, and how was it different than Zuleika's? That I really can't say, because that, it was, you know, playing Latin music, man, uh, there was certain things that happened. You know, it, it wasn't the focus of the music wasn't on Vince Garaldi. It was all based around, really, Cal and Amanda Peraza. And the Latin buoyancy that was taking place in the music. And in, in Latin music, because of uh, the rhythmic foundation, you have a tendency not to really focus on anyone in particular. Mm-hmm. You know, but because especially when 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 Amanda took his solo, which was the highlight of of every song that we did, it was it was rhythm. So for me, it was it was a blessing because I had a chance to really learn how to play time, how to understand time. Mm. Mm. I I know. Listen, and be I, able to and be able to play with time. I would I would have never learned that with no other kind of music at the at the time. I never had that. I never had the freedom to do that with no other music that I had played. Right, right. But from that, every other music that I went to, I had an advantage because I could. Yeah, you were playing all the the Latin rhythms, uh, not so much different time signatures, but just so much, so many. It was multi. It was so much percussion, right? I mean, right, right. so much, and, so and, much and, rhythm. And you, and you, but the thing was, you learn the time atmosphere, so that there wasn't no fear of playing, turning it around, playing time one time signature against another. You could do all these different kinds of things because it was all fluid. You could feel like all these things are in. In one thing, you could play four four, but you could play three four against it. You could play six eight against it. You could play any other time signature against it. So you gave a freedom of playing time, which which really made it a whole lot easier because for, you know you, you learn how to play with with different time signatures. And you're playing in. A live setting with real people, and you're not in a classroom reading some 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 textbook. You're you're out there every night in the in the fire, learning, doing it, doing it, doing it. And we know now that which was which was how Congo and uh, uh, Potato and and, and Peraza and, and uh, Candido. Francisco yep. All of the Cuba players who came from Cuba and, and Puerto Rico, this is, this is what they did. They yeah. played with, with, with just Cougars and, and Bungles. There, there was no musical uh, uh, instruments other than the drums. 
so the drums did different things that, that created this atmosphere of music. So that was the, that was the atmosphere, and this is what what Cal fell in love with, and with most of the people who fell in love with Latin music. That's what they fell in love with the, the freedom of time. You could dance to it, and you know once you got control of what was happening with that, you could do everything, and everything was a part of it. Did um was Peraza in the band when Garaldi was with Jader prior to you joining? Yeah, he used, he was in the band when he used to call him and say, "Damn, well, they're scared." But I'm no, I'm talking about before call, when you were still with with uh, doing doing the uh, when you were down doing primarily work in Los Angeles before Monk got you the the invite to um, try out. Garaldi was in Jader's band. Or they were in a band together, and I'm wondering if Peraza was in that band as well. I don't know. Yeah, because I was going to say there's a there's a there's an uh, a, a show from Northern California Bay Area, 1972. Someone taped it, an audience recording. Carlos Santana, Armando Peraza, and Vince Garaldi in like a 21 minute jam. That's just incredible. And so, I wonder if he had pre prior experience. Uh, playing with uh, Peraza, uh, clearly. You know what? That might have been. That might have been later. Well, no, that show was from. That show was a good eight or nine years after you and you were with Cal. That was when you were with Gene Harris. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was after. Because when I was when I was there playing with Cal, Vince Garaldi, I mean uh, uh, Santana, he wasn't that good. He wasn't <laughs> good enough to, to play with them. Wow. And there's a little place around the corner. And uh, he had his band, and he was playing around there. But he wasn't—he wasn't that good. It wasn't until later that uh, he got to a place where he was able to sit in with people because he had been consistently playing and doing things. Talking but with I had left the band long before before he uh, played with Cal. Carl, um, we have to pick this up again uh, real soon because I want to talk about uh, the uh, the. Um the, the Art Pepper tribute experience, but well, the, only, the only final question I have for you about um, the, after the Charlie Brown, uh, You're a Good Man, uh, did you have a chance to play with, did you ever get a chance to jam with Vince or play with Vince after that at all? Uh, yeah, he, he played a concert with, uh, with us in uh, Marin County in uh, for some, for some whatever reason, the album like I wasn't able to make it. So he played. And uh, that was a really nice affair. You know? What made it? I think, that, yeah. I think that was the only time that he played uh, the whole job that I remember. He may have done it before that, but that was the only one that I remember. It was at a school. And... Uh, it was a we, we, it was a really nice uh, musical experience. Was it at a, at a do you know it was a, a public school? Was it an a school school of music? Where 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 was it? It might have been it might have been a private school in, in, in uh, Marin County. It was across the Golden Gate, over on the, on that side of the bay. Oh, that's a beautiful story. So Zuleika couldn't couldn't make the gig. Vince sat in with Gilbert Peraza and. Cal and and you, and yeah. and you were playing for kids. Yeah, it was a school for for young people. I, I seems like it was junior high school, maybe. A private school in it might have been. It might have been, uh, it might have been a high school, but it was a private school. Right, right, and it, yeah, it was. It wasn't your. your it wasn't a, a music school. It was just a. It was a private uh, school. Right. That, that was that. Was that kind of something that would? How would that? How would that happen? I mean, maybe a band teacher from the school would, would Cal would make, have be friends with them, and they'd invite him in to play with his band. I mean, that seems like you couldn't dream of that happening today. <laughs> uh, well, you could, and it does happen. It's, you know, situations like that happen all the time. Really, it, it depends on uh, how it comes about. Sometimes it's a music teacher that does it. Sometimes it's a, a director in the school that likes music who feels like it would be a good experience for the kids, and uh, they do it. Uh, you know, those kinds of things happen all the time. 
I don't. I, I I'm going to challenge you on that, buddy. I, I'm going to challenge you. I don't, having you might be able to bring in someone uh, to to do some work at a university, but the idea of public schools shedding their band programs, especially in the in in poor, I don't I don't see I don't see a, a quartet with the likes and the chops of Bur- Burnett, Garaldi, Peraza, Jader, and Gilbert being brought into. Anything around in the Southwest, let alone Los Angeles or San Francisco, because of the, the you know, you want to go to the SF Jazz Museum to go see Bobby Hutcherson play. That's great, but they there ain't no more music in the public schools or private schools anymore, my friend. Well, not anymore. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking. About, I'm talking about right now. That that to me is such a beautiful thing that because what you said before was absolutely vital. It wasn't just the fact that you were. It wasn't the fact that you were just playing. It's the fact that there was education going on as well. It was the two track yeah, thing. Knowledge. People, yeah. People realize the benefit of music for the kids. Right. And the benefit that they get when learning and understanding and experiencing. Creative music that doesn't exist in the school systems anymore. It's barely existing in the colleges. Right, because the whole mindset has changed from what education means. Because I, I'm reading these these posts online, uh, you're getting three weeks worth of tests. Kids are doing tests. That's too, many, that's too much. That's, that, that's too much freedom for the kids anymore. Right. There's a fear of that. Right. And it's and it's an uns- unsubstanti. I think it's a fear, but it's unsubstantiated because the most progressive and the most organic things come from the opportunity to have a real diverse uh, form of education, not teach to the test, teach to the test, teach to the test, which basically turns you into a you know a semi droid kind of thing. You know, it's like it's a little. You know, it, it takes the, it takes the, the the kind of control that they want to have. It takes that away from. Uh, it's a system. They're, they're, I'll say, they're afraid that it will take it away. Not that it does. They're afraid that it will. That's why they don't have music in schools anymore. They're afraid, of, say that one more time, it's very important, they're afraid that it, it's going to take away their control? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I tend so to agree. Give them too much idea, too many ideas of, of free thinking. Uh-huh. And especially, especially if you get some uh, some cats that are already uh, kind of, uh, you know, they got their marbles together and they're smart and they're going to take that creative energy and they're going to, you know, it, 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 on, on a certain level, it's what you guys were doing with Sam Brown back in the day, driving him nuts with all that music you were playing. He said, stop playing all that music, you know, that, what are you playing? Yeah. But the truth is... Yeah, look, look, look at that. That, that situation was one that drove him nuts to the point where he just refused to do it anymore. <laughs> but yet it wasn't... You know I mean? Yeah, but he was... But you know what? At his core, whether he admitted it or not, he was like, man, these kids are doing something totally different and I don't understand it, but I'm not... It doesn't It doesn't make me afraid. I'm not going to shut it down. I'm not going to cut the funding. I'm not going to... I'm going to... You know, there was a... It, the idea was that, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to help people in, 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 uh, find more better consciousness, more love, more spirituality, and it's going to, knowledge and wisdom is going to go up at the same time. It's, it's, uh, and there's an imbalance uh, today and with the propensity towards success being valued only through monetary uh, means, uh, it, it even doubles down on that because people say, oh, what are you going to be a musician for? You're going to be poor. But you, to me, there's the intangible stuff that that you can't you can't quantif- uh, quantify uh, music, and especially, um, you know, uh, the the kind of music that that you guys have been uh, doing over and over uh, again, um, and continuing to evolve over the last few decades. Um, you know, I I, I uh, what 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 they, what, what they saw happening was. But the music was not just something that uh, people just did over and over and over and over again. It was uh, an educational process that was taking place in the music because it, it created another kind of consciousness. Exactly. And and it wasn't 
wasn't a negative consciousness, but it was one that wasn't understood by people who weren't doing it. And it became a threat because the people who didn't do it and just became teachers were out of sync with it. Right. Because even though they were educators, supposed to, what they studied to, to be educators, they weren't able to pray it themselves. Because it wasn't uh, 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 an, uh, an education that you just get by rote. Right, exactly. You had to experience this. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm. You, had to, you had to know what it was, but you, but you learned by rote. But then you took, it took off from there. That was, that, for me, that was the experience that I, I think I mentioned to you once about playing free, free music. When, once I, I real, I had an experience of trying to uh, play a rock guard music mm -hmm. and trying to understand what it was that they were doing. Right. And how they were able to do it and still play together. Still know where each other was so that you could still have the cohesiveness of, of still being able to play the music together and still know where you are. And, and one day I was watching a, a space flight that took place in Chicago, like a ship down in space. And, uh, uh, for whatever reason, it didn't come back in the same window that they expected it to come back in. Right. So because it didn't come back in that window, they had to go make another revolution around, around the Earth because it couldn't just come back. It only can come back in certain windows. And... and when I heard that, it made me think about what was happening with the avant-garde music. The guys that really had gotten to a point where they were able to do it and play it, I realized what they were doing was they played a form of a song, and then they would go away from the form, and certain guys, I noticed, were able to go away from the form, and play something else, but they would still come back and play together. And I had this picture in my mind that that's what was happening with the music. When they left the form of the song, they were out in space. And they would come back in certain windows. And if you were able to go and, and, and do the same thing that they were doing and watch for those spaces where they come back, you were able to come back with them because if they didn't come back in particular windows, you had to wait and come back for the next window. Wow. Yeah, so, but there, there were, uh, but like, they and they might have had to make another revolution around the, 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 in the stratosphere, but eventually they had, there were there were certain windows they could re-enter into. Right. 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 Mm. Only, only it wasn't something that they wrote down. It was something that you did, but you had to understand the concept, and it was a kind of unspoken concept. Nobody talked about it, but but everybody was able to do it, and it just gave me how people could do it and not talk about it. Until I recognized what was happening with it. And I started thinking about it in that way. And I recognized that it worked. One final question in this in this uh, in this segment, Carl. Uh, um, uh, do you do you have any little any anything that sti what's the biggest thing that sticks out in your memory aside from his mustache about Vince Guaraldi? I mean, his playing was. Is there a story that you can relay? Is there any kind of nugget of information? <laughs> uh, no more 
then uh, the pork pie hat. That, uh, Mingus, that's Mingus, right? Yeah, that Mingus is aware. Right. You know, everybody had, everybody had something. Everybody did something. <laughs> but at one point, at one point, I, I used to wear a hat all the time. Right. I looked at, I looked, I was seeing quite a few uh, videos of things I did with Harness. I used to wear a hat. Things I did with friends, I used to wear a hat. And uh, I just saw a few things that some people from Italy sent me that, uh, uh, one of them I didn't have a hat on, and it was like strange to, to see it when I didn't want to wear a hat. And so that, what you're saying is Gar Garaldi's mustache was the equivalent to you wearing a hat? Is that, am I following that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah people did, they had certain things that they did, that they did. To, to people, what you saw was one thing, might one thing to you, but to them, it didn't mean that. It was just what they liked. What they did. You know what I mean? Absolutely. No, and, uh, you know, I, I love the way you weave these stories, Burnett, and, uh, you know, the Pepper Legacy, uh, you know, I want let, to, let's plan on, uh, we'll talk soon, I, I want to uh, get back and talk a lot more about that and how that experience sat with you and, and, and the, the other projects that are, that are in the works right now, and uh, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time this morning to continue to uh, give other people uh, knowledge and wisdom uh, uh, all over the world and, uh, and to share your stories with uh, your collaborations with Vince.